about the year. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's our neighbor. Hey, I brought back all your stuff I ever borrowed from you. I love it. Okay, you, what? you just stay right there. I'll show it to you, all right? Remember this? Thank you for that. I know I borrowed this to make them muffins, but it is fantastic at sifting through the cat litter. <laughs> I'll get you a new one. Hey, is this your house key? You know what? I'll just let myself in. Stop! Hey, sermon's up there, mister. I'm trying to learn about my Savior's power. Resurrection. Whatever. Hey, you go to church? Yep. Why didn't you just invite me? Daddy, why didn't you invite Kevin to church? Oh, please, like you invited your neighbors to church. <laughs> oh, God. Glad y'all are here. Happy Easter. It's really not that difficult. Difficult, okay? These are our flyers are available. We have some more that are available out in the entryway when you go. Just a simple invite. Uh, as I was at my insurance agent this last week paying my insurance bill, I offered one to the agent saying, you have no place to go on Sunday. We'd love to have you come. Left the information. It's right there. It's not that difficult, okay? So just take time. You find somebody, have God lay on your heart a simple invitation to come. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, so I wanted to bring some things to our attention today. As we put it up on the slide, we're going to keep the slides up there going about the different things that are taking place for our Easter aspect. We have a variety of opportunities that are taking place for Easter time. In our invite that we have, we have two services next week. If you take your bulletin, you'll notice in there the details of what's taking place for Easter Sunday. May I encourage you? That if you could come to the 8.30 service and allow the 10.15 service seats to be for our guests, we would greatly appreciate that. This year, we have the identical service in both worship opportunities. So if you come to the early service, you'll get exactly the same service as at the 10.15. But do know that the 8.30 service, we do not have programming for children. No nursery and no wonder worship. But we still encourage you to come and then stay for the fellowship time afterwards. During that fellowship time will be a special extravaganza opportunity the outreach ministry is putting on in the fireside room for our kids. They'll take place along with some, some goodies that will be available for us to enjoy Easter Sunday morning. They're in that 9.30 to, to 10.15 hour. And then, of course, our 10.15 service will have again the same service as 8.30. So may I encourage you. To do that. If you notice in the back of your bulletins, I kind of gave some notes just to kind of prep us for what's taking place at Easter. Because sometimes Easter is that time to realize there are people that are searching and looking, looking for a place to belong. That's why we're, we're wanting people to know they can belong here. What are some of the things we could do? What are some things you could do? Three simple steps. Pray, practice hospitality, and participate. Pray at home for what God is doing and moving in our community. We want to be the light of Jesus Christ in the Cleveland community. May I encourage you, if you'd like to put your prayer into action, that we're going to have a prayer walk to some different simple areas through the building. These will be available at the entry tower on Tuesday night, and we're also going to open it up on Wednesday night. Right after work, come on by. The building will be open. You can pick up and just simply just take some time to walk around this facility, thanking God for it, but also asking for him to use it for his glory. Let this place be a place where people can find a place to belong in Jesus Christ. Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, a half hour later, 
we will have interact intercessory prayer in the conference room for those who would like to attend. So that's Tuesday and Wednesday night. Good Friday service, of course, is coming up. And some other things to take notice there, practice hospitality. Come to that early service if it's possible. And also, as you come, we have limited parking here. If you can find a parking place and be willing to get a little exercise so you can walk off the refreshment treats at 930, we would appreciate allowing us to have some closer parking spaces for our guests next Sunday. And there's always a place to plug in. Ellen can use help with uh, extravaganza here and gives wonder worship. We always have little things in the worship service, some extra help with chairs and logistics. We would love to plug you in. And you know the nice thing about coming to the 8.30 service? That means you can help serve at the 10.15 service. So what an opportunity is available for you this coming week. So keep that in mind. Let's keep that lifted in prayer as we take time to celebrate the great news of what Jesus Christ has to offer us in that resurrection celebration. As we get ready to prepare for worship, one other announcement I want to bring to your attention. Uh, Mr. Crow, would you stand up so people can see who you are? He brought to my attention that there is a cantata at the uh, chapel, the Waterville Bible Chapel, a special congregational cantata on Saturday at 10 o'clock. If you'd like to know more about that, find that man. He can give you more instructions on how you can participate. We are glad that you're here today. Welcome. For you that are home, braving the blizzard on television instead, thank you for joining us today as well. As we get ready to worship today, if you have a prayer need, would you just raise your hand right now? And Gary's going to come by. He'll be leading us in prayer later on. Be able to lift those up before the Lord. We want to be sure to take those prayer concerns accordingly to him as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great day to celebrate and worship our risen king that we will be talking about later next week. Tonight, today, we're going to talk about the Palm Sunday, his triumphant entry into the city. Would you all be standing as we enter to this time of worship with our call to worship that's on the screen? From Psalms 24, 7 through 10. With me, please. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your hands, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is he? This King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory.
Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory.
morning as we uh, prepare to hear Pastor's message, we want to pray for the prayer needs that have been uh, brought to our attention. And uh, the power of prayer is powerful. And we're, uh, we're privileged to be able to do that and pray for one another. So this morning, we just take a couple minutes here. And let's go to God in prayer and just uh, commit this day and this whole week uh, to the Lord and uh, just pray that he uh, continues to work in our midst. Father, this morning, we're just humbled and honored that we can just uh, gather together at this time. No matter what the weather does, uh, you're always present, you always protect us, and you always just look forward to us uh, fellowshipping with you. So today we're here to do that. But Lord, we just ask uh, some blessings upon those that are requesting some uh, special needs be met. Lord, we just pray for Bill Morrison this morning. He's having hip replacement surgery this week. We just pray that you would uh, just be with the surgeons and uh, the health professionals and just allow things to go well for Bill. Lord, too, we just pray uh, for um, Lowen. He's just a precious uh, son of yours and a brother of ours. And we just pray that you would just be with Lauren as he's back in New Prague again. And this struggling. So, Lord, we just pray for comfort. We pray for healing in his body this morning. We pray, too, for uh, Terry's uncle, Daryl, from North Mankato, who's in hospice care. Father, this is just a difficult time for, for Daryl and also for family. So, we just ask that you would just give him peace and comfort, be with the family on this journey as they're, they're uh, traveling down this road of uh, probably the end of someone's life. Father, too, we just want to pray uh, this week uh, for our Easter services and all that's going on here. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint this sanctuary and fill it with your presence. As uh, we uh, come together on Friday evening and during the day on Sunday morning there, we just pray for your presence and for your Holy Spirit to move in hearts and minds. And even now this week, we pray that you would touch lives, uh, touch those that you would have to come to the service next week. Lord, just uh, speak to them, that small voice, and just uh, encourage them to, to come to hear your word. So, Father, today we just want to pray for Pastor Rob, for the message he has for us. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint it and allow the words that he speaks to just have relevancy and impact in our hearts and our lives. So we commit that to you, and we just give you honor and praise and glory. And it's in that most precious name of above all names that we do pray and ask these things. And it's that name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise God. from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Passover is fast approaching and thousands of Jews from all over the Roman world have now made their pilgrimage back to Jerusalem for this annual festivity. Jerusalem literally streets are packed as the regular population of Jerusalem throughout the year would be about 25,000 people at this time. But during the festivity time, the number of people exploded. The crowds in the streets could be four to five times that in the city. 
And in the midst of all this hustle and bustle, there's this growing chatter about this rabbi. This unique teacher and his extraordinary accomplishments. The word on the street is that he appears to be the anointed one by God. He's a miracle worker. They, they say that at, Bath, at Bethany, which is less than an hour walk away from Jerusalem, right close to this town, they say that this man of God just a week ago actually raised a dead man back to life. Lazarus was his name. He had been dead and buried in the grave for four days, but now he's up walking around alive. The news about Jesus has spread like wildfire. And now, as the Passover festivities are about to begin, huge crowds have flocked into the city. Thousands hope to see for themselves this man. This prophet, in fact, the buzz on the streets is speculation that this Jesus could be the promised one, the chosen one. Could he be the Messiah? The religious leaders of the day also are very aware of the vibrant news that's growing in this following that seems to have admiration for this one called Jesus of Nazareth. Have your Bibles turned to the book of John as he records this account today for us in the 12th chapter from the NIV translation I will be reading for, starting in verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, came not only because of him, but because to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Verse 12, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festivities heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on. The Passover festivity is just days away. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to, com to commemorate the feast that remembers the deliverance of Israel from the bondage and the suffering in Egypt, the Passover. Soon, Jesus and his disciples will celebrate this Passover meal in an upper room. It will become his last supper. A meal that even yet today, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we continue to observe as we too share in the Lord's Supper. It's called communing together. Communion. Inaugurating this week that many of us call the Passion Week or Holy Week, Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem and it happens on Sunday, the very Sunday today that we call Palm Sunday. Jesus rides in Jerusalem on a young donkey. In itself is a fulfillment of an ancient Prophecy from Zechariah 9, 9. Oh, rejoice! Shout, daughters of Jerusalem! See your king come to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. We usually don't associate a modest donkey with kingship. In fact, in fact, it was appointed a royal animal by a Jewish monarch, but by, by David himself. In 1 Kings, when David is appointing his son Solomon to be king after him, David takes Solomon and he sets him on a donkey, a mule, in public de declaration that he now is the new king of Israel. The donkey was an, was an animal that had symbolic Significance of humility, peace, and royalty in the line of David. The crowded streets of Jerusalem. Now this crowd pours out of the gates into the, the thoroughfare that's leading into the city. The cheering voices of our gathering crowd grows into crescendo as Jesus makes his way toward the city gates. Hosanna! Save us now! Jesus 
is greeted in a messianic fashion as they wave palm branches and they lay their cloaks on the road for the donkey to trample upon. Hosanna! Save us now! Oh, Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! These are the prophetic words of Psalms 118-26. The Jewish leaders of the day are witnessing and disdain the unfolding events outside the gates. And now it's making its way through the streets of Jerusalem toward the Temple Mount. And their reaction is not one of jubilant celebration. No, theirs is one of pious apprehension. Look at verse 17 of the 12th chapter. John continues. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the dead, raised from him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many of the people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. You see this Jesus, whom they had been attempting to trap and to discredit, he has been growing exponentially. His message and popularity now has literally gotten out of control. And now today, he has given this messianic praise by all these people. It's causing havoc in the city. We cannot allow, they think, this Nazarene to be the downfall of our religious arrangements with Rome. How dare he? How dare he allow the crowds to extol him as the coming Messiah. You see the commotion, this common expectation of the Messiah in the first century was an anticipation of a political revolution, a revolutionary revolution. That which was taught about the Messiah that day was a conquering ruler who would come in and release the nation of Israel from Roman dominance. A warrior savior is how they pictured the Messiah, who would put Rome in its place. They were looking for a political champion who would restore the Jewish nation to its former glory. The Jewish leaders of that day, they grew in animosity as they witnessed this growing procession making its way through the streets. The palm branches that were being waved were a significant point of Jewish pride. And the religious leaders knew how it must appear to the Roman soldiers that were guarding the streets. These cheering Jews waving these palms was to the crowd like they were waving their national flag. Because you see, just a few decades later, during the Jewish revolt, ancient coins that would be made by the Jews would literally have a palm leaf as a national symbol. The waving of palm branches shows, shows us their, sort of, their, their support of a king who would come and bring about a transformation, a political revolution. Hosanna, they cried. Oh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed will be the new king of Israel. You see, the Jewish leaders watching the cheering crowd knew what this meant. And this Jesus of Nazareth needed to be stopped. We, we saw that in verse 19. See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world is gone. After him. Yet those who lined the streets that day, they had the right inside. But they had a misinterpreted the agenda. Scriptures had been, been misapplied. Prophecies of old had been distorted. They saw the Messiah is coming as this conquering king over this temporal oppression of Rome. The Messiah, they saw, would come and set them free from the bondage of the tyranny of Rome. That's what the Messiah's purpose is. Yet Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, as he begins what we call Holy Week, he came as the Prince of Peace. He rode the noble animal symbolic of humility and peace 
in royal accordance to the line of David. Jesus came as the Christ, the anointed one of God, who would indeed be a conquering king. Yet oblivious to the crowd that day, he would accomplish so much more, so much more vitally important a victory on their behalf and a victory on our behalf. Father, on this day of Palm Sunday, our hearts cry out along with that cry, Lord, save us. Save us now. Help us, Father, as we look at Jesus to understand who he is as the Christ, the Son of God. Literally, the title, the Christ, is the most frequently used title for Jesus throughout the New Testament. Its authors nearly 600 times use this word, and, and, and most of its occurrences of the word Christ, the Greek word Christos, it's linked to the given name of Jesus at, his, at birth, Jesus. Jesus, the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name, okay? Just want to make that clear. Christ is a descriptive word. It's saying Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Messiah. He's not Jesus bar Joseph, Jesus the son of Joseph. No, he's Jesus bar Yahweh. Jesus the son of God. In Matthew 8, and also found in Luke 16, we see Jesus toward the end of his ministry as he's rallying the support of his disciples, sort of a final exam in their ministry experience. He asks a pointed question, who do you say I am? And in Matthew 16, we hear these words from Peter's mouth, you are the Messiah, you are the Christos, you are the Christ, the Son of the Jesus by Yahweh. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus Christos. Jesus, the Anointed One. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Messiah. Biblical scholars have determined that there are more than 300 distinct prophecies found in the Old Testament concerning the coming of the promised Messiah. And all of them were fulfilled in the person of Jesus. In fact, 10% of the prophecies were all realized in what we will celebrate this week called the Holy Week. He is the Christ, the Messiah. The notion that the Messiah, the Northern would come as a conquering king, was widely talked by the scribes and eagerly received by the Jewish population in Jesus' day. It was their ongoing hope that they would see one day the unfolding of Jerusalem being again the capital, the, the, the political influence. Scripture tells us that even Jesus' disciples didn't really understand what the Messiah was about. In, in John 12, this very chapter, looking at verse 16, at first the disciples did not understand what was going on. Only after Jesus was glorified, did they receive that these things have been written about him and these things would be done to him? It wasn't until he ascended. Like everyone else in Israel, the disciples, they themselves even misunderstood what the Messiah would come to do. And even after Jesus' resurrection, Peter in Acts 1 says to Jesus, Are you now going to restore the kingdom? Those who followed Jesus the closest had their own preconceived ideas of what the Messiah was going to bring. He was going to restore Jewish freedom. He was going to bring about political supremacy. Some have suggested that even Judas in his betrayal was nothing more than him hoping to manipulate Jesus to begin a rebellion against Rome, setting up his conquering kingdom. To the disciples and most of Israel on this day, they thought Jesus was a miraculous deity. He could easily handle Rome. Jesus could heal the sick, he could raise the dead, he could feed the multitudes from a few loaves of bread and fishes. 
Jesus had shown that he had the ability and the advantage that he could give to the Jewish nation. He could give this advantage to any army that might raise up and overthrow the Roman oppressors. After all, isn't that what the prophecies are all pointed to? The promised anointed one, the Messiah? Hosanna! Save us now! The day they saw the prophecy of the Messiah as the one who would come and sin was sent to restore Israel and, and take her away from her suffering. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Ah, but instead, this Messiah came to redeem his people. Not to save them from the suffering of oppression, but through the Messiah, through suffering, they would be laid upon him as the Messiah in Christ. Entering Jerusalem as he did that day, on that donkey, Jesus was boldly announcing that he was indeed the Messiah. No wonder in Luke's account, he tells of how these indignant Jewish leaders rebuke Jesus and his disciples for allowing such things to be proclaimed about him. In Luke 19, verse 39 and 40, some of the Pharisees of the crowd come to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus says, Oh, I tell you, if they kept quiet, the very stones would cry out. You see, in the triumphant entry, which we celebrate today on Palm Sunday, Jesus is declaring himself he. He chose a time when all of Israel would be gathered together at Jerusalem to celebrate this very important feast of deliverance called Passover when this huge crowd would see him in the public proclamation. It was by, was, was, even though it was mistaken by their, by their account, it was no mistake in who he was. Disciples in the crowd were jubilant and rejoicing and Jesus acknowledged and accepted their praise. This was Sunday. But Friday changed everything. Jesus knew what was in store for the Messiah. And on many occasions he had predicted and foretold the price that needed to be paid. The Messiah's death was part of God's predetermined plan for man's redemption. Jesus told his disciples on many occasions that this victorious Messiah, what he needed to do, but even the disciples hadn't understood. For now the crowds were jubilant, they were rejoicing, but in a few days' time those same people would bow to the Jewish leaders' religious pressure, and that same crowd who shouted Jesus' praises would scream their demands for his execution! The nation of Israel failed to grasp the full role of this promised Messiah, the anointed one, the one chosen one of God, and the victory that he would come to bring. Passages like Isaiah 53, that the Christ, the Messiah, would be a suffering servant. The Messiah would be despised and rejected by mankind. He would take up our pain. He would bore our suffering. He'd be pierced for our transgressions. He'd be crushed for our iniquities. By his wounds, we would be healed, be oppressed, afflicted, be led like a lamb to the slaughter, be cut off for the transgressions of the people. He would be punished, and the world and the Lord would crush the Messiah and cause him to suffer. And through the Messiah, he would make him the offering for sin. See, the problem we see on this Palm Sunday was that people were lining the streets, shouting, Hosanna, save us, blessed is the King of Israel. The crowd yet didn't have a clue why Jesus had even come and what he was to do. And today, there are still many just like them come to church, they follow the crowds, 
They join in on the joyful songs of praise. They sing along with their hosannas, the hymns, because it's tradition. Or possibly they raise their voices along with their hands. They sing along, blessed is the king in a new chorus because it's nice and a catchy tune. They follow the crowds in praise. They follow the crowds in worship. But they don't realize and understand what Jesus came to do. Many today still extol Jesus as an earthly Messiah. One of their own personal choosing. To take away their suffering. Give them what they want in deliverance. But the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the Christ, he came to be the chosen Lamb of God. So let me ask you, do you realize what Jesus has done for you? Do you realize what Jesus' triumph entry is really all about? Is it all about this, this passing the parade? Is it all about religious fanfare? Or is it about a mighty warrior of God who came to save you? To save you from the damnation of your sin? Because you see, as Paul wrote... In Romans 3, all have sinned. Everyone's fallen short of God's glory. None are righteous. Not one. Do you realize that Jesus' triumph in entry is really all about? Do you realize what Jesus has done for you? You have sinned and you fall short of the glory of God. Yet you can't be justified. You can be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by the Messiah, Jesus. Do you understand that that victorious Messiah came to die on the cross to pay for your sin? So you can be forgiven. And you can be restored in a right relationship with God presented the Messiah, Christ, as a sacrifice of atonement to the shedding of blood that's received by faith. Hosanna, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. That day, the worshiping congregation gathered on the streets of Jerusalem, shouting to the one who they thought would restore the nation, the Messiah they desired. What's the Messiah you desire? One of a personal conqueror for your convenience and for your comfort? Or the one who humbly enters? Your life is king, the king of peace. The one who's come to redeem your sins in his death and restore for you a relationship with God. John, who wrote the book and the scripture passage we've read today, finishes his book with these words. And to conclude this message today as well for you, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. Oh, you do understand. This Holy <clears throat> Sunday, as we sing and shout about Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He came to pay the price for you. He came to pay the life. Let's sing together. The words will be up on the screen of a very powerful song to remind us again about this one who came, the perfect Save us 
It really is a cry of our heart every morning and every day. Because we can't save ourselves. There's nothing we can do that would ever wash away the our liberty, our sin, our shortcomings. No religious traditions. No family tradition. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. If you have not Encounter Jesus as your Savior. May I implore you this week, this week known as Holy Week, to understand the true essence of the Messiah who came for you so that you can be restored. That's what we celebrate. That's what Good Friday is about. That's what we'll talk about next week in the and the new life we have in the resurrection. But it all starts with your understanding of who the Messiah is. As believers of Jesus, those that have responded to him, this time of communion is very, very special. Because in a sense, it reminds us of the need for the Messiah. The need for the one who we call Hosanna to save us now, to forgive us of our sins, because it's not by the things we do, it's all because of what he did in that grace of the gift of grace. So this morning, as you come to the table, or as you take there in your seat, and you take that bread, remember the Messiah, the one who came in the flesh. Hosanna. As you take it, was able to save us now. And as you take that cup, the representative of his blood, 
that which will unfold on Good Friday, the very blood that forgives us of our sins, that perfect land of God. Hosanna saves now. Because you see, we all need the Messiah. We all need a rescue, a savior, and his name is Jesus. Father, thank you for sending us this wonderful gift of redemption that's found in the person of Jesus Christ. And as we take this time to remember, I pray that each and every participant, as they take the bread and they take the cup, acknowledge their need of the Messiah, their need for him to save them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come. Come to the table. Our vocalists come to the stage for our closing song. Well, let me again remind you of all the things we've got going on this week. We're going to slide up on the screen. We have Good Friday service on Friday at 7 o'clock right here. Don't forget the prayer walk on Tuesday and Wednesday night. The building will be open there after work for about a couple hours. Feel free to just walk around and take time to just lift up what the Lord is going to do in our midst today. Strive to dance for our kids during that fellowship hour. And don't forget to come to the first service if you're able to, to allow us to have as many seats as possible in that second service for our guests. Let's all stand together as we close this time of service together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the jubilant celebration. Thank you for praise. Thank you for worship as we celebrate. As we move into this holy week, this passion week, to be reminded again of your great love for us, for you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever will believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's close with the song, King of Kings. <laughs>
you.